<clears throat> well, this morning, <clears throat> excuse me, we're going to begin to look at that last paragraph in the fifth chapter of Matthew in the Sermon on the Mount. And as I've already told you, this has to do with loving your enemy. So let's go ahead, <clears throat> excuse me, and begin <clears throat> by reading the text, Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 through 48. Jesus says, you have heard <clears throat> that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven, for he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. May the Lord bless his, uh, his word again to our understanding this morning. Now, obviously, this morning we're returning uh, to the Sermon on the Mount to take up the next subject that Jesus has to teach us about life in his kingdom. Remember, what he's talking about here is the new life, uh, what new life in the Lord Jesus Christ looks like, that life that comes from the new heart that Jesus has given to us in the new birth. That new life is going to, to be a, a kind of life that exhibits a greater righteousness, than that of the scribes and Pharisees. So again, Jesus is contrasting what he is teaching here, what that life looks like with what it is the people of Israel had been being taught uh, by their leaders, by their teachers. Now this time, our Lord Jesus Christ isn't dealing with a specific law like he did in uh, the other examples that we had, what, like when he taught us about murder or when he taught us about adultery or even the keeping of our vows. Nor is he really looking at a specific standard of justice, which is what we looked at last week. Remember Jesus said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Uh, a rule that is actually meant for the court of law, but not to be used to settle personal grudges. Uh, there's that law of retaliation, which is for the courtroom. There's the law of non-retaliation, which has to do with us. And, and really, uh, what Jesus is telling us this morning is kind of a contrast to that. Rather than getting angry at your enemy and retaliating against your enemy, you are to love your enemy instead. So what he's teaching us here is really a more general law that sort of captures everything that we are to do towards our neighbor. This is the same law that I've already told you that Jesus mentioned when he was answering the lawyer's question about the great commandment in the law, which of course is to love the Lord your God. He calls it the second great commandment, but we do need to notice that it is great. It's second only to the first. Again, we read about it in Matthew 22, verses 37 through 40. And he, that is Jesus, said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. The Apostle Paul calls what Jesus is dealing with here this morning a summary of everything God wants us to do for our neighbor. And really that's what it is, a summary of that. Again, he writes in Romans 13 verses 8 through 10, Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. I love this verse because it reminds us of what's behind the law of God. It's not just a series of do's and don'ts in order to you know, sort of quench our fun, which is how the world looks at it, but really it is how we are to love. And when we love in this way, nobody gets hurt and everybody gets helped. 
Well, that's what Jesus is dealing with here. Next to loving God with all of our heart, loving our neighbor is the most important thing we can do, and that's what Jesus is dealing with now. Instead of retaliating, instead of hating your neighbor, you are to see your enemy. You are to love your enemy. Now, I've already mentioned that today we're going to look at five things. Today, three of them this morning, two this evening. Whom we are to love, and again, Jesus here is contrasting what he is teaching, what God actually intended by this law to what the scribes and the Pharisees were teaching. So what is he actually saying? What it means to love your enemy and what it doesn't mean. Uh, why we should love our enemies. And then this evening we're going to look at what this looks like. You know, how should this work itself out in our lives? And how are we going to be able uh, to do this? So first of all, let's look at whom we are to love. And again, let me just simply point out what we've looked at and noted at in the other commandments Jesus deals with here, that he is setting out to correct a misunderstanding of God's law that was promulgated by the Jews. This is what the Jews were teaching. Now, when Jesus says things like he says here, for instance, in verse 43, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Even though he may sometimes quote either the law or portions of the law. Uh, after that statement, he's not actually intending to deal with specifically what the law of God says. He's first dealing with what they had been taught about what the law of God says. And the way we know the difference is when Jesus is quoting the law of God or the word of God, he says, it is written. But here he is saying, you have heard that it was said. So this is what you were taught but what you were taught is not necessarily the right thing. And as a matter of fact, most often it wasn't. Now, the first part of this statement is a commandment. It is what God commanded. We read in Leviticus 19, verse 18. You shall not take vengeance, nor bear any grudge against the sons of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. And actually, as I've read that passage, you can understand why the Jews raised the question that they did when they asked, to whom does this actually apply? Should we apply it narrowly to just those who are part of the Jewish nation? After all, it does talk about here, the sons of your people. Should we apply it even more narrowly to those who love us? Or should we apply it more broadly to everyone? including our enemies, those who hate us, those whom we hate, you know, and obviously in the Christian life, there is no room for us to hate our neighbor. Now, the scribes and the Pharisees taught that it should only be applied to those who were close to you, to your friends and not to your enemies. And again, think about the mindset of the scribes and Pharisees and their desire to justify themselves, their desire to appear as righteous in the eyes of others. If you're setting out to interpret the law of God, to determine what it requires, and you're hoping to be able to keep this law or to convince yourself that you are keeping it, and therefore that you're all right in God's eyes, you're always going to lean towards those interpretations that make it easy to do. Those that are less self-denying, certainly those interpretations that will make it possible for you to keep. Now think about it. How difficult is it to love those who love you? Jesus says it's actually quite easy. As a matter of fact, so easy, just about anybody can do it. To the Jews, remember, the two most despised groups of people in the world were the tax collectors and the Gentiles. The tax collectors, because being Jews, they were helping their enemies to profit from their own people. They were taking advantage of the people by taking taxes for the Romans and maybe a little bit extra for themselves. The Jews hated tax collectors and the Gentiles. Strangers to God's covenants, far off from God, unclean. I think you understand how the Pharisees looked at Gentiles whenever they came close to one, they would just basically pull in their robes and they wouldn't yell unclean, but they would consider the person to be unclean. 
But Jesus points out that even these whom the Jews despise the most, even these could do what the Jewish teachers believe God requires. He says in verses 46 and 47 of our text, For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Tax collectors and Gentiles, they love those who love them. They receive those who receive them. That is very easy to do. It may even be easier to hate those who hate you. That's, that's easy. That's the second part of the Jewish equation here in verse 43. Jesus says, you've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. I think we all know from our own experience that this is the way our hearts naturally incline. When somebody does something wrong to us, they offend us or injure us in some way, our first response typically is not, uh, well, that's okay, I'm going to just serve you and do good to you in return, or I love you, but it's usually we get angry and we want to strike them back. And again, that's why Jesus dealt with what he did in the previous chapter. So we know from experience that that is also very easy to do. But what about loving your enemies? That is not as easy. As a matter of fact, it's really beyond our natural ability, but not beyond the ability of the new nature that our Lord Jesus Christ gives to us. So again, he gives us first his spirit, and then he tells us, this is what I want you to do. Gives us the power to do it, gives us the command. Jesus says in verse 44, that's what you, you've heard this was said, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. You know, he's actually settling here the question of who our neighbors really are. They can be also our enemies. Now, remember this morning we read the parable of the Good Samaritan, and that was Jesus' response to the lawyer who was questioning him about this very thing. But again, I want you to notice why the lawyer asked the question, as I pointed out before, we read in Luke 10, verse 29. But wishing to justify himself, he said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And here again, we see the mindset of the, of the Jew, the Jewish uh, Pharisee, the lawyers, the scribes, and the Pharisees. He wanted to justify himself. He wanted to prove to himself and to others that he was already doing what he needed to do according to this commandment. But what did Jesus actually show him through this parable? That he was keeping the commandment? No, that he was still far from keeping it because he wasn't loving his enemies. So who is our neighbor? Well, according to this parable, Jesus says everyone is our neighbor, including those who hate us. And he's saying if we want to be good neighbors, we will help everyone who is in need, even our enemies, like the Good Samaritan. Okay, so that's what is being required here of us. Now, let's look at this perhaps a little bit more deeply and try to understand what Jesus means by this. Is Jesus telling us that we need to be able to see something good in our enemies? That we need to see something that is worth loving in our enemies? Now, sometimes that's what we think, and that's why we have a hard time accepting this command. But that isn't really what Jesus is saying, that we have to find them to be lovely. Uh, there's two words used in theology to describe the difference of what we're talking about here. It's actually a difference that can even apply to, to God, as we'll see in just a moment, as far as how he views and how he loves. There's what's called a love of complacency and a love of benevolence, and I realize those are two big words, but we'll look at them now. A love of complacency is what we experience when we love someone because they are beautiful. You know, when you see something that's beautiful, and it doesn't even have to be a person, but something that is attractive to you, something you find to be beautiful, your heart goes out to it. You, you automatically desire it. Uh, whether it's a beautiful landscape, if you see some beautiful trees that are changing colors, or whether you're looking at the Grand Canyon, and you look at, uh, again, just the, 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 the huge picture of, uh, well, what's really a, a monument of, of the flood, 
but uh, we still find it to be something awesome and something attractive. Or when you're looking at somebody that is attractive to you, your affection automatically goes out. As a matter of fact, it's not really even a choice that you make, but it's a response of your heart to what you see because it's beautiful, it's lovely. You find it to be lovely. Now this is, let me just say, that this is what we experience with the Lord Jesus Christ when the Spirit of God opens our eyes to see that beauty in the miracle of the new birth. Now Jesus said to Nicodemus in John 3.3, and this is what he was talking about, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, and we understand from the context there that that new birth comes from the Spirit of God, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And by the way, seeing the kingdom of God is not like the heavens open and suddenly you see this physical building that's floating in space, but it's seeing the beauty of that kingdom, the desirability of the kingdom, the reality of that kingdom. The Spirit of God opens our eyes to see that. But he shows us not just the reality. He shows us the beauty of these things. He shows us the beauty of God, the beauty of his kingdom, the beauty of his ways. He shows us, with regard to salvation, the beauty of our Lord Jesus Christ and of salvation through him. And now because we see that as lovely, because we see that as desirable, because we see Jesus as desirable, our affections go out to him and we receive him as our Lord and Savior. We trust him, put our trust in him, because we see him as one worthy to be trusted. And that way of salvation to be the beautiful way of salvation, the right way, the good way, we trust him to bring us to heaven. And then we also see what it is he's calling us to do is something also desirable. And so we want to do it. By the way, what, what we're talking about here is really called illumination. You've heard of the illumination of the Holy Spirit. He illumines the pages of Scripture. Well, he doesn't just illumine Scripture. He illumines everything that has to do with the kingdom of heaven that the Scriptures actually tell us about. We see the beauty of all these things. We often think of illumination as sort of a help God gives us to study the Bible, and it does help us study the Bible. If you hated the Bible, you'd never pick it up and read it, right? And so you won't learn anything. Or if you're doing it against your will, you, you'll be fighting yourself to try to read it and to, to understand everything it says. But if you love it and you desire it, you open it up and you gobble it up like, well, like a miser gathering up gold and silver. You know, it's precious to you. Well, that's what the Spirit of God does, but he does that with everything that has to do with God and his kingdom across the board. We see it now as beautiful and desirable, and so our hearts automatically go out towards it. Now again, let me just note that it's not that these things weren't beautiful before, it's just that we were blind to that beauty. We didn't see it. Jonathan Edwards describes this work of the Holy Spirit, this work of illumination, this, as, a, as basically God giving us a new spiritual faculty, like another sense, like sense of seeing or hearing that allows us to see what it is that those who are blind, which are the spiritually dead, cannot see. It's basically, you know, think of it in these terms. Can a, can a blind person see or understand color? They really can't because they have no point of reference. They don't have the, the faculty. They don't have the, you know, that sense, the ability to even perceive it, to see it. Or person who is born deaf. Can, can they appreciate music or even understand what music is? Well, they can't because they don't have the sense to, to understand what music is. They've never heard it. It's something you have to hear, just like color is something you have to see. Well, in the same way, we really can't perceive the beauty of God's kingdom unless we have this spiritual sense given to us, this illumination of the Holy Spirit. And once he illumines it and shows us the beauty, then our hearts go out to it. We love it because it is beautiful. And by the way, we are blessed if we're trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ this morning because we were blind, but now we see the beauty of the Savior by this miracle of the new birth. Now again, this is the love of complacency. And by the way, this is also the same kind of love that the Lord has for us now that we're in the Lord Jesus Christ. When he came to us, we weren't lovely. We're going to see that in a moment. 
But in the Lord Jesus Christ, we actually are lovely. All of our sins are taken away. We're clothed with the perfect righteousness of Jesus. And when the Father sees us in the Lord Jesus Christ, he sees us as something beautiful. And his heart now inclines toward us because we are beautiful. Now, that's an important distinction because this is the, this is the difference between how God looks at us and how he looks at the world. And this is also going to be the difference between how we look at our enemies. You know, do we look at them this way or do we look at them this other way? Well, let me just say, Jesus is not telling us here that we need to have this kind of love towards our enemy. That we just see them and they're so lovely and beautiful, we, our hearts just go out to them, we have to help them. That isn't the way it works, and I think you understand that isn't the way it works. But what he is telling us is this, that we need the other kind of love which is called a love of benevolence. This is a love that doesn't need to see anything worthy, anything beautiful in the object because it's a love that's purely in the subject, in the one who is loving rather than in the object of that love. Benevolence means to wish well, to want something good for others, and so reaches out to them in mercy to show them that good purely because that's what you want to do and not because the object demands that you do that. Now, the best way, I think, to understand this would be by way of example. And that brings us to our third and final point this morning. Why should we love our enemies in this way? Why should we want to do any good to them? Well, Jesus says we should because that is what the Father actually does. And that's also what we will want to do now that we share his nature through the blessing of the new birth. Listen again to what Jesus says in verses 44 and 45. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the un righteous. So why should we love our enemies in this way? Because that's how the Father loves his enemies. And, and just to make sure we understand what he's saying here and what he's not saying, he's not saying that we will love our enemies so that we might become uh, children of the Father. Again, that would be a works salvation. We do not earn our salvation by our works. We cannot become what God wants us to become in order to enter into his kingdom. We have to trust Jesus and his power to make us that way. And if we're trusting him, his power will do what is necessary in us to complete this. What Jesus is saying is that when we love others in the way the Father loves them, we will show that we are his children because we're doing the very same thing he would do. Now, when God looks at the fallen human race, at the evil that is in his enemies. Do you think he finds them to be lovely? No, he doesn't find them to be lovely at all. His heart was not drawn out to the world or to us because we were beautiful. As a matter of fact, it was just the opposite. We were repulsive to God. Before we were in the Lord Jesus Christ, remember, we were spiritually dead. We were rebels against the Lord. Paul writes in Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 3, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked or lived according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. We weren't children of God. We didn't share his nature. We did everything God hated. We loved everything that he hated. God did not see anything in us that was attractive. We weren't righteous. We weren't looking for God. We didn't do anything good in his sight. Everything we did was evil. Remember what Paul writes in Romans 3, verses 10 through 12. As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good, 
there is not even one. This is a description Paul gives us of the entire human race, Jews and Gentiles combined. We read a little bit earlier in, in our meditation, actually, this, this particular verse we didn't read, but that we were God's enemies when he sent his son into the world, Romans 5.10. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So again, think of, of what all this means. We were dead in sin, rebels against God, nothing good in us, had done nothing good, not seeking God. We were his enemies. And yet, we read in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Now, think about what this passage means. God is loving the world, and the world here, it's agreed by uh, biblical scholars, is, is not referring to a world of perfect people, but it's referring to the world that we know, a world which is in darkness and in sin, in wickedness. God showed his love towards a world that hated him by giving that which was most precious to him. And he did not do that because we were so beautiful to him. He did it because of the love that was in his heart. You know, it's also from that same great love that God provides everything. Everyone with everything that they have to enjoy. Jesus tells us in verse 45 again, he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. These are not symbols of good and bad things. These are all good things, sun and rain. You need sun, you need rain. If you're going to have food, if you're going to have life, and God provides it for everyone. Think of the psalm that I read for the call to worship. God is good to all. Now Jesus tells us this morning that as the Father loves his enemies, so as his children, as those who share his nature, as those who represent him in this world, we are also to love ours. So again, the commandment to love your neighbor ex extends to your enemies. We don't have to find them lovely, but Jesus says that out of the love he gives to us, we need to do good to them. And we need to do this because this is what the Father actually does on a daily basis. And now that we are like him, this is what we will do. Now this evening, we're going to consider the last two points, and that is what this love should look like and how it is we can love in this way. So if you're able to come back this evening, please do. But for now, let's just think about this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Really, that's what the Lord's table is reminding us of this morning, teaching us of this morning, of God's great love. This is what he in his mercy was willing to give and to extend toward us while we were his enemies. As we would prepare to come to the table, let's think about what Jesus now tells us that we need to be willing to do towards our enemies. We need to reach out to them with the same kind of mercy that the Father has reached out and continues to reach out, of course, to the entire world on a day-by-day -day basis. If we have found within our hearts that we really don't want to love our enemies, we enjoy nursing grudges against them, we enjoy hating them and so forth, then I would say don't come to the table until you've dealt with that sin because the Lord does not allow us the option really to hate anyone. And I think even when we see the judgment of God falling on individuals, we shouldn't stand over them and gloat. You know, don't rejoice in the downfall of your enemies. The Bible says we always need to be caring, concerning, and merciful. As a matter of fact, the Lord says we need to extend that to others. If we are to experience it or have experienced it ourselves, we need to be those who are merciful. So let's, um, let's as we bow for a moment of prayer, let's... Um, Think about what we've just been challenged to do. And I'll tell you what, before we bow in prayer, let me just again uh, read this text of Scripture because I want us to think about this. Perhaps we don't need to have two sessions of 
silent prayer because these two really combine uh, together. But I just want to remind us from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, which is how we generally introduce the Lord's table, that two things are going on here. We are to remember what Jesus did, and that's what we've been doing. But we also need to make sure that when we come to the table, we are trusting in Jesus, and we are turning from our sins. And particularly, we need to think about this, this um, duty that our Lord reminds us of this morning, how we're doing in this particular area. But let me read this passage again. Afterwards, we'll pray, and then we'll uh, come to the table. Paul says to the church at Corinth, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So as, as this morning, as you would receive the bread and the wine, remember the Father loved you so much while you were his enemy that he gave a son. And the son laid down his life for you while you were his enemy in order that you might have life. So remember what Jesus has done and let that call you to do the same. And then the second part, to make sure that you are doing this, you are trusting him, that you are turning from all your sins that we all are. He says this, Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself. And in so doing, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick and a number sleep. But if we judged ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged... We are disciplined by the Lord so that we will not be condemned along with the world. Again, the Lord calls us to self-examination as we prepare to come to the table. So let's spend just a few moments now in prayer and let's ask the Lord to help us to do that.